So we're here to talk about Podman, otherwise known as Pod Manager, or the other way around. We've got a few things to share, primarily around uh, what's new for Podman 4.0, which makes its presence in Fedora 36. Just starting off with a quick description from our colleagues. I think this best describes Podman in a single sentence as being daemonless, open source, secure, Linux native tool designed to make it easy to find, run, build, share, and deploy applications using containers and containers images. So if we look at, uh, if we look at uh, what we're focused on and for, just kind of a quick overview, we'll be discussing the new network stack. Uh, we'll do be discussing Podman machine and uh, what we have today and where we're headed. And then uh, a bunch of Podman 4 highlights as it was a very large release. Okay, uh, so for uh, Podman 4, one of the big changes is a uh, move on from our previous network stack, which was called Container Network uh, Interface, and uh, known as plugins, Container Network plugins, uh, as packaging. Um, our new network stack is written in Rust with a keen sense on uh, performance and reducing the binary size of our network stack. It really came down to two new components, which are both uh, separate GitHub projects. One is called NetAvark, and that does all the interface configuration, firewall rules, IP tables rules, and port mapping. And then the secondary component is Ardvark DNS which is a, a container DNS server that we wrote. And this particular one is geared specifically for uh, proxying, as a proxying DNS server, as well as being able to uh, resolve container network names amongst each other. Um, the Ardvark DNS actually replaced a, a setup that we had with DNS mask. And so this replaces the, that setup and is uh, working quite nicely so far. Okay, so I'll be talking about the core benefits of the new network stack, why you should care about this. Uh, number one, improve support for IPv6 out of the box. Uh, Podman has supported IPv6 to a limited degree for quite a while now, but we have had some serious limitations on how you did it. Uh, you needed a publicly routable v6 subnet. You needed to specifically route that v6 subnet to the machine that was hosting Podman. And at that point, it would probably work. We've had varying degrees of success. Uh, the new stack is designed to work out of the box. We take a public or private, rather, v6 subnets, and we NAT it the exact same way that v4 works. Uh, this is not as technically correct as the previous approach, but it has massive benefits for working out of the box. Uh, it's going to work, uh, what do you call it? Basically, you don't have to worry about configuring anything. It should still work. Uh, on top of that, Let's see, we have advanced DNS support. Uh, container DNS ha is a very important feature of Podman, where basically if I create three containers, let's call them DB and front end and uh, web, I can have DB ping either front end or web and by name, that is. So we have a DNS server for all the containers and it allows you to hit any other container by name. However, uh, in the previous implementation we had with the CNI plugins, it was only able to work for containers in a single network. So we've expanded that now, and it works with containers in as many networks as you want. And as part of this, we've done a general improvement to how networking works uh, for multiple networks. You can join 
uh, as many networks as you want with Podman Network Connect, and you can now set different static IP addresses, static MAC addresses for the networks you're joining. Significant improvements over there. Uh, speed. We have made the uh, experience of Podman run significantly faster with this change. Uh, it turns out that the process of running a container, a sizable portion of it is just setting up the network stack for the container to use. Uh, Brett previously mentioned that they were called the CNI plugins or previous stack. That's because they had different plugins to do different parts of networking. So to actually set up a container, you'd end up running about five of these. Netavark is a single binary that does everything. And because of that, we've actually, this was completely unintentional. We made things rather fast. And finally, we have a solid focus on the single node, a solid focus on what Podman needs. Uh, the CNI plugins are not actually a Podman project. They were created to support Kubernetes. And we have had some conflicts in the past where they are doing things that are better for Kubernetes, whereas we don't really want those things. We want things that are better suited to running containers on a single node. And eventually we decided that it was better to do our own thing, uh, write our own stack that was just single purpose, designed exclusively for Podman to do exactly what we needed. And that is what Netavark and Aardvark are. Uh, these two are... We're pretty excited and expect a lot more from the future for them. Okay, now I'll be going over the general process of how networking at Podman works, specifically with Netavark and Artvark, but uh, CNI did the same general thing. So we start off inside of Podman, inside what we call LibPod, which is the pod manager library we use. It's basically the heart of Podman. And Podman has just been told to start a container. This only happens on start. If you create a container and let it sitting there, you do not have a network. We only set this stuff up when you are actually running one. And we're going to create a little configuration to hand down to Netavark. Uh, the configuration has basic information, what type of network mode you want, uh, mostly we talk about bridge networking, where you have a bridge on the host and the container connects to it. But there are also other modes like Mac VLAN, where the container is directly connected to an interface on the host. Uh, basically, it allows it to get an IP address on the network that the system is connected to, as opposed to an internal IP address that gets added. Uh, and then... Once we have that configuration with any information that we need, static IP, static MAC addresses, et cetera, we head it down to Netavark. Netavark is going to start off by handling any global system configuration that we need to access the internet. This is mostly sysCDLs. We need to enable routing. We need to enable v6 routing, a few other things. Then we're going to create the network interfaces required. Uh, most notably, this is going to be the bridge interface I talked about previously. But we also have a VETH pair, a pair of virtual Ethernet interfaces. One of them is connected to the bridge on the host, and one of them is connected to the container. And that's how traffic gets to and from the table. And then we are going to do some IP tables configuration to get uh, network address translation working, uh, what we call NAT. And that's going to allow the terror to talk to the internet. Uh, there are two types of NAT we need to do. One is a global NAT for the bridge, which basically says any container connected to this bridge, any IP address really connected to the bridge can be translated out to the internet. So that lets general traffic flow. But then you also have port forwarding rules. I can do, say, podman run hyphen P8080 colon 80. So that means we need a what we call a one-to-one -one rule, which is going to allow that one port to be translated to one specific IP on the bridge. And then we're going to call Ardvark, or specifically, we're going to edit Ardvark's config. Ardvark is a container-specific DNS server, but it's still a DNS server, which means it needs to know what IP addresses it's serving and what names are associated with them. So we're going to take the container name and we're going to take the container's IP addresses and we're going to shove them into the Ardvark config and reload it. And once that happens, any other container on the network is going to be able to ping it by name. Okay, so uh, are you going to get Netavark and Ardvark is the next question. 
Uh, the answer is if you are upgrading from 35, probably not unless you explicitly want it. Uh, this is a new stack. We recognize there may be potential bugs. We don't want to break anyone's installation. So we are not migrating anyone who just upgrades who was previously using Podman. If we detect that you have any containers, any images, any pods, anything that at all changed on your Podman from a straight default, we are going to keep you on CNI. If you want to move over to NetAvark, we recommend that you do a complete reset of the system with Podman System Reset that removes everything, containers, pods, images, etc. Or you can opt to manually edit the containers.conf config file to change yourself over. Uh, but if you are on a fresh installation of Fedora 36, you will get NetAvark by default. Uh, no migration concerns there. Uh, Brent, you're muted. Okay. One of the other big ticket items for Podman 4 uh, is the Podman machine work we've been doing. And uh, just to give a, an overview here, Podman machine is very similar to the mission of Docker desktop. Right now we're CLI only, but it essentially allows you to use Podman to create a virtual machine that runs a specialized uh, version of Fedora Core OS. And then the Podman uh, command on the host or the Podman executable on the host interacts with the system service running inside the VM. And this allows uh, operating systems like Mac OS who can't run a Linux uh, native or Windows which can't run a Linux native container uh, to be able to take advantage of running Podman. It uses uh, Fedora Core OS underneath it's sort of a appliance-like approach and probably most important to people right now, <clears throat> no cost, no sign up, no registration, just use Podman. We support Mac OS via Homebrew right now and it's a simple brew install Podman. In the future, we uh, do intend to have a self-contained Podman, Podman package that will do the installation and help you configure uh, your, force, your first VM uh, or machine as we call them. It's supported on Windows. We have a guided install now that uses uh, WSL for its virtualization. Same sort of user experience there. You, you can run Podman in WSL and everything is easy and taken care of. And you can also run it on Linux. Any distribution like Fedora 36 should be able to run it as long as it has Podman 4, its dependencies, and Cumulum. Quickly uh, looking at some of the features, it's a very easy to use uh, approach. Uh, once you have it installed, for example, on Mac OS, you simply do a Podman machine init <clears throat> and Podman will go pull the uh, virtual machine image down, uncompress it, uh, boot it with a specialized ignition file. And when uh, it returns back and says, all right, you're ready to go, uh, you can begin using Podman uh, as you would on a regular Linux machine. We do uh, also now, uh, by default, map the sockets from the virtual machine back into uh, the host, host OS, so for example, the system service for Podman, what a lot of people would think of as like the Docker socket is being mapped back into Mac OS so that you can use things like Docker Compose or um, Docker PY to interact with the socket. And then we have uh, default volume mounting and volume mounting, basically the ability to be able to take a directory from the host and uh, mount it into the virtual machine and the containers can then take advantage of it. And the other thing is uh, the port mapping. So uh, when you normally run Podman machine on a Linux installation, for example, it would be common space to say uh, map 
port 8080 or map port 8000 or anything like that for some sort of web application, we do that as well. There's a little bit of extra trickery going on in the sense that the port mapping occurs both on the virtual machine and the host machine so that you could, for example, curl localhost at a port and it would be interacting with the virtual machine's containers. Okay, now we transition to Podman's uh, highlights, and I think this is kind of what we're here for. Matt, quick time check. We have about 12 minutes. All right. Uh, so Podman 4 is our largest release to date. Uh, over 78 new features, large number of bug fixes. You can see the general statistics there. Part of why this has been such a large release is that it's a longer release than we usually do. Uh, normally, we try and get a release out every three months. This one took about double that to get the network stack right. Uh, one thing I will note, we only have a relatively small team working on Podman full time. So non data contributors, the vast majority of those are from the community. All right, we mentioned the new net, network stack and took a deep dive in it, but just sort of looking back at it, uh, Matt mentioned the IPv6 support, the DNS support, uh, improved startup time, and the focus on signal node networking. One thing we didn't hit is that Netavark and Ardvark also work in uh, for rootless users uh, without any um, without any significant effort to make that go. We put uh, quite a few new things in for, for Kube. Some of it came from the community, some of it came for us. Uh, this would be relative to the Podman play and generate commands. Um, we now support uh, Kubernetes, Kubernetes init style containers, which is a container that can uh, be part of a pod that runs and executes first. Uh, it's an excellent use case for uh, being having a setup, for example, uh, do some database setup before the actual database container runs is, is a pretty good use case. We've got uh, new volume support for com config maps with PlayCube. Uh, we can now also build images on the fly, similar to Docker Compose. Uh, you just need to set up the, the correct uh, directory structure and have a container file present and Podman will build everything before it brings it up. And then there are new command line options that have been added, quite a few, to PlayCube. Uh, a good, uh, one of the ones that uh, I'd like to let people know about is the replace. It used to be that if you ran a uh, PlayCube instance, you'd have a pod uh, or more running. And then if you ran it again, you, it would air out because uh, the name is basically taken already. So, Matt, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah, we had, a little, we had a little burp there. Okay. So the, re the replace command lets you override the name. And as such, uh, you don't get an error anymore. It just brings down what was there and puts up the new ones. A couple more kube related things. We now support injecting environment variables from field ref and resource field ref sources. We allow you to set default resource limits with PlayCube. And just as a public service announcement, we'd like to see you stop using Docker Compose and our justification for saying something like that is that Docker Compose, uh, while is wildly popular, is only useful for Docker. While we do uh, we do support Docker Compose, but if you uh, begin using the PlayCube generate cube functions, you'll be working straight with Kubernetes YAML, which allows you to be able to take uh, a workload or a set of containers from Podman and generate uh, YAML representing those in a pod and then be able to push that YAML file to Kubernetes and off it runs. You could also do the reverse, which is to take a YAML file out of Kubernetes and run it on your single node 
by also replaying or playing a YAML file. We've got some machine improvements. Um, I mentioned some of them in the specific uh, overview earlier, but we mentioned the Windows uh, support for Windows and an installer now. On Windows, we've got the volume support in 4 and 4.1, socket mapping, and the ability to be able to change hardware allocations uh, once you've defined your VM. We used to not allow that to occur. Uh, okay, so we also have a number of enhancements for pod functionality. If you're not familiar, uh, Podman lets you group containers into pods similar to Kubernetes, but uh, this is some cool functionality that we've had for a while, but it's not really gotten the amount of love it deserves. And we're starting to change that now. Uh, the first things we're doing is adding support for the ability to add volumes, devices, security settings, and sysedls to your pod that will be automatically set in all containers that join the pod. So I can add a volume mount that mounts something into every container in the pod, a shared volume. And then let's say that the, that volume mount requires that I disable SE Linux. Dan is going to hate me for saying that, but I can automatically disable SE Linux in every container in the pod so they can access the volume without issues. And this is really just the beginning. There are over 120 flags in Podman Run. I want to see almost all those flags in Podman Pod create. So you can create a pod that has anything by default. Okay. Um... So Podman 4 was the big flagship release, uh, and that was back in February, I believe. But uh, we just last week came out with Podman 4.1, so just want to hit a couple highlights on those. Uh, we've With Podman Machine now, we've got a default volume mount being added. And so what that's doing is mapping dollar home from the host to dollar home in the virtual machine. So if you were on Mac OS or I was, it would literally be users print Bounty on the host. And uh, within the virtual machine, it would be users print Bounty, And therefore, you can take advantage of that by uh, knowing that it's going to be statically there and, and you can run it with your container. We um, put Podman on a diet and we're able to reduce the Podman's uh, binary size by 15%. Uh, relative to Podman 4.0. Uh, we were able to get Docker Compose uh, version 2 working. If you haven't followed along, the initial Docker Compose was based on Docker PY Python. And the new work that Docker's been doing, it's uh, all in Go. So we now will support that. And we've done a number of enhancements uh, to build including better support of build kit. Uh, so Podman build now has improved support for build kit. And I should clarify here that we are not directly implementing build kit, which is a new way of building containers. More accurately, build kit has a bunch of additional options for building containers that the original Docker build Podman build do not have. So we're just adding those options to Podman build. We're going to make ourselves compatible in that way. Uh, the biggest things here, we have a bunch of new mount types. Most of these were already available in Podman run, but now you can do cache mounts, bind mounts, tempfs mounts into your builds. You have better control over output, including the ability to output directly to a tarball, directly to a directory, instead of creating an image and then exporting that image. Uh, improved multi-architecture support. You can now explicitly specify what architecture you're getting your base image from using the from instruction. And some minor enhancements to manifest lists. Previously, you had to use the uh, Podman manifest tag, I believe, command to tag them. Now, Podman tag does as well. Okay. We are nearly complete here, but just want to talk about our community. Podman does have a happy, healthy project going right now. We want to make you uh, all aware that we have a monthly meeting. It's the first Tuesday of every even month. We focus on talking about project news. We do a lot of demos. 
uh, and we actually ask users of Podman to come uh, present ways in which they use it or side projects that they're working on that are relative to Podman. And then on the uh, odd number of months, I believe, then we have what are known as community cabals. And here, these are uh, basically discussion and problem solving uh, uh, discussions where uh, the, they center around uh, features or large bugs that we need to have that warrant larger discussion than just one person going in and fixing it or implementing a feature. We also have uh, an email uh, list for uh, people to ask questions, support, uh, things along those lines, and all of that can be found on podman.io. Speaking of which, uh, we'll end here with some of our social media and communication avenues. Uh, again, most of the action is on GitHub. I mentioned podman.io. We also have a Twitter handle and our newly renamed YouTube channel. And that is okay. it. We have a couple of questions in the Q&A. We'll try and get through one or two of them real quick. Uh, first one is, what about Podman containers without Kates? Any Podman Compose equivalent? So that that's what Podman play Kube. So basically, we yeah. believe Kubernetes, <coughs> Kubernetes YAML files is, a, is the replacement for Docker Compose. We want to work with the way, same way Kubernetes does, same formats. Okay. Um, somebody mentioned specialized Fedora Core OS. Does that mean you're building or generating a different Fedora Core OS image or just adding uh, an extra layer on top of the existing one for the Podman machine? We are, uh, right now, we, we are kind of painted ourselves in a corner because we're releasing Podman 4 and 4.1. Yet Fedora Core OS is anywhere from two to is it two to six weeks behind, so it takes us it takes a little bit of time for the Podman packages to make it into one of the FCOS streams. However, so we have been making one that include the latest stuff. However, the plan is as soon as four one filters into some of the FCOS streams, we will turn off the. Uh, our builds and it'll switch over to FCOS proper.